tales for dark nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself, if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome back. Don't worry. I won't keep you waiting this time. And without further delay, I give you chapters 16 through chapters 20 of Drew Stepik's Knuckle Supper. Chapter 16 Ghosts Tahoe looked around the grounds of the Battlesnake's compound from a perch on top of the brick fortress wall. This is weird. I reached the top of the barricade and looked around as well. There wasn't one guard or a King Cobra bootlicker in sight. Gives you kind of a bad feeling, doesn't it? Usually the place was crawling outside with the biggest and baddest snakes in the gang. If it weren't for the presence of the always alert guards in front of the compound, the Battlesnakes would have been abolished years ago by some disgruntled gang, tired of the tyranny they posed. Makes me feel a little oogie, Tahoe said. If I didn't feel a little oogie as well, I would have taken a moment to point out the lameness of Tahoe's choice of words. Investigating the area further, we rounded the wall's perimeter... Tahoe, they know we're not this dumb. What is the point of this? I mean, it's pretty obvious we're walking into a trap. We were, after all, invited to walk into the trap. I ground my teeth a little and stopped to think. Was it sheer obnoxious arrogance of the snakes that led them to believe we'd break into their house to be killed? Anyone would have brought a weapon to their own funeral. Better we'd be frisked before we're let inside. What else did they say to you? I told you, Copperhead said, bring the drugs, the money, and King Cobra. Only it was in that lame Jamaican accent. Oh, I don't like this, bro. We need to go now. I grabbed Tahoe by what was remaining of his recently shredded sleeve top. As far as we know, the Knucklers are all dead. There's just me, you, Pico, and Dez. And Dez is somewhere inside that building. If they want their money their drugs, and their leader. I find it hard to believe a scavenger hunt is what they have in mind. You think it's a surprise party? I released my grip from the frayed shirt and tapped Tahoe on his bulky arm. 
Yeah, buddy. It's a surprise party. I felt bad for the guy, but sometimes the absolute ignorance in his questions made me wonder if he was even conscious. Get down there. I shoved him over the barbed wire into the cement parking lot below us. He looked around nervously and then looked back at me, only answering questions by shrugging his shoulders. For some reason, the motion-sensitive floodlights that blazed from every corner of the building reminded me that he still had that ridiculous Ziggy Stardust makeup smeared all over his face. Not in any mood to laugh at the poor steer or knee him in the nuts for his clowndom, I opted to jump down and take his side. As I landed, a few more lights shot on. It was then that I expected an entire platoon of battlesnakes to pop out of the ground, covered in camo and leaves to go commando on us. The question at that point wasn't so much, why didn't something that theatrical happen? It was, where the hell were they at all? I pointed to the eerie, uninviting front door of the compound. I... Suppose we should... Are you sure, RJ? This isn't good. There's always an army of folks out here. What choice do we have, Tahoe? Besides getting Dez out of here, we need to stop all the butchering that's been going on. We're going to have to face the music at some point, and better it be on our terms than them hunting us down and killing us. I grabbed him. You didn't see what they did to Leroy and Skillet. If that is any measure of what they have planned for us, then they will find us and destroy us. This is much more to them than us kidnapping Cobra, stealing their drugs, and cheating them out of money. Also, having these fools simply kill Dez is much too gentle for him. Even though I didn't have any idea what my punishment was going to be when I had that little shit in my hands... My loyalty to him as a friend and a brother remained for some reason. Conflicted, I knew that I was beyond the point of a tongue lashing, but I also knew that it was going to be difficult for me to kill him. I'm going to teach that little prick a lesson, I said. I coerced Tahoe to the door. Ignoring the huge gold snake that covered it from top to bottom, I knocked. There was no response on the other end. Only the faintest sound of reggae rhythms could be heard. I knocked a little louder with both my fists, still getting no response. I rattled the door latch of the first Battlesnake security measure, the thick, steel front door. As I predicted, it was locked. Tahoe, I said, resorting to his steroid strength. Ram it. At that point, the thought of breaking into our own cemetery and not even making out like poor-ass grave robbers seemed secondary to the mystery of the meeting. Reluctant, Tahoe stepped in front of me and braced himself sideways. He closed his eyes, hiding the fear of being blitzed by an arsenal of weapons under his mascara. He plowed into the door once with his shoulder and compounded the steel. It only crumpled inwards slightly because its half-power and hesitance weren't enough to disengage the lock. After shaking his shoulder, Tahoe backed up further on the front stoop and switched sides. He looked at me hoping I was going to give up and call it a day. I said, We need to do this, dude. He wheezed a few times, unsatisfied by my persistence, and rammed into the door again. This time, the door latch fell off, and I heard a distinct click that signified that it was unlocked. Getting into berserker mode, Tahoe and I both hacked away at the compound door with the soles of our boots until it flung open and then stopped midway after the top hinge fell off. Lights flickered on and off inside, and the tawdry gold fixtures, stairs, and chairs were dulled with the blood of what we could already tell was a battlesnake holocaust. I moved Tahoe aside and took the lead. At first glance, all we could make out were dreadlocked heads and body parts throughout the foyer and lining the ostentatious staircase. As I walked further, I noticed much more. Not only were heads decapitated everywhere, the brains and internal organs were completely, almost surgically removed from the Rasta's corpses. It was as if whoever killed them wanted to make absolutely sure they were dead. Apparently, they didn't get the memo that all it took to kill a vampire was taking off the head, ceasing any brain activity. 
We sidestepped over body parts and innards to pass through the entrance and into the dining hall. Tahoe stopped at one of the pompous paintings of King Cobra that was framed inside thick, solid gold. RJ, why didn't they take any of this expensive stuff? I don't think that's the real question, Tahoe. Why? I want some of this stuff. I slapped his hand off the picture frame that he was giving a Thai massage to. The question is who they are. No gang did this. I looked over toward the doorway to the banquet room and saw a white head stuck under a part of the sweep. Responding immediately and somewhat hoping it wasn't Dez, I rushed over. With my boot, I kicked the head over. It wasn't Dez. He was still mine. I wasn't even a gang member. At least, this guy wasn't from any gang that I was familiar with. It was an older man with gray hair, smashed wireframe glasses, and bushy eyebrows. Who's that? Tahoe asked as he paced around the proximity of the head looking for a matching body. I don't have any earthly idea, I answered. Jokingly, I added, maybe the snakes were having problems with the IRS. Neither Tahoe didn't get my attempt at a joke, or he was scared shitless by the aftermath we walked into. Rather than explain the one-liner, I instructed him to follow me into the banquet room. If anyone was still there, our cover was far from blown after we barreled through the front door. Cobra's table was filled with a true feast reminiscent of the Last Supper. As in the foyer, more corpses were left in pieces. Some were still in chairs and others under the table. And again, there wasn't any sign of the attackers. All we had to suggest that it wasn't the impact of a civil war eruption between Cobra Snakes and Copperhead's younger followers was the head of some middle-aged nobody. I caught Tahoe licking his chops after eating one of Cobra's finger snacks off the table. I gripped the straps of my backpack tightly. Come on, I said. With a mouthful of delights, he gasped and shrugged and said, You always talk about how awesome these are. I've never really been invited over here for dinner. Besides, I love soul food. Quit fucking around, come on. I led him toward the throne room where Cobra loved to put on his little reggae sunsplash concerts, like the one he had performed for Bait and me on Halloween. Well, I told myself, at least we wouldn't have to worry about these assholes ever again. We shoved our way through the electric wall that opened the throne room theater into the dining hall. Before I had a chance to investigate the area and clear it for entry, Tahoe beelined to the center of the room where several white corpses laid in a line as if they were being prepped to be bagged and removed. They were all wearing Catholic priest garments. The cloth. Tahoe, no! One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That was the number of Christmas lights that I counted in a split second that popped up on the back of Tahoe's head. He turned around to look at me like an excited little boy who had been playing in his mommy's makeup to tell me he'd unraveled the mystery. A finger hung from his mouth like a lollipop. When he realized his face was nearly covered in red lights, the smile dropped, as did the finger. He brushed at the target lasers on his sleeves, arms, and chest. He then looked at me and blinked one last time with bewildered eyes as gunfire erupted and his face was torn off section by section, leaving only the top of his spine peeping out from his gold Jim's t-shirt. At first, his arms whipped around and his hands fluttered uncontrollably. Then, his immense shoulders released and his knees buckled, and he fell to the floor. As his entire torso collapsed, the line of corpses behind him bounced around like jumping beans as they were riddled with bullets. Slipping at first, I ran back the way I came in, through the banquet hall and into the foyer. I squashed the head of the bodiless enigma outside the dining room as I rounded the corner toward the door. I leapfrogged from body to body in an attempt to exit, and then I stopped dead in my tracks. <coughs> hey, RJ, she said. 
coughing into her hand and using the broken door for support. She lifted a double barrel shotgun in my face. It wasn't so much that I was confused, in shock or in denial, as it was the overall feeling of defeat. It took that fucking junkie whore bitch a couple of years, but she got the last laugh in her personal vendetta with the battle snakes. As I started getting pistol whipped and stock socked in the back of the head, I fell to my knees only to be rained on by a dozen or so cattle prods. Fat Mac wants him. Don't kill him, she said. Then, one of the prods hammered me across the eyes, and my world went black. Chapter 17 Adversaries Reynolds, wake up! My head seemed to be ballooning in and out, and my body ached like I smoked a bunch of rocket fuel and launched myself headfirst into a telephone pole. Rusted springs from a cheap cot prickled into my back. Reynolds, get up, you dumb white bitch! The memory of being beaten down propelled me up on the bed. The rocket fuel dropped into my lower bowels. Sickened, I laid back down. I struggled to open my eyes only to realize they were covered in bandages. I felt the sides of my head. I hacked only to have phlegm rejected halfway up my esophagus and sent back down to my lungs to fester. Sliding my fingers down past my ears, I stopped at a metal collar bolted around my neck. I didn't bother trying to rip it off. The tight noose was there to stay. My nose picked up the smell of rat droppings, Ajax, and pig blood. My ears picked up the sound of a distant choir. Damn, Reynolds. They messed you up, fool. Carefully, I unwrapped the dressing that covered my eyes to reveal the vagueness of a dank room lit by a single bulb. I didn't do it to see who was yapping at me. I already knew. <sighs> What's up, Cobra? I thought you were dead or kidnapped. <clears throat> something. My eyes started adjusting to the dark room, painfully unblurring my environment. Oh, shit. We were both in cells right next to each other. He was facing me, bound on his stomach to the plexiglass slab that was pressed up against the jail bars. He was practically crucified. One of his eyes dangled down, bringing attention to his smashed-out gold teeth. His dreads and the top of his head were cleanly chopped off. A few pins stuck out of his brain that had post-its adhered to the balls on the ends. His entire body was potholed and scaly as if his enemies had tortured him with massive amounts of high-energy light. Around his neck was a collar. I'm sure it was the same as the one I felt around mine. His tongue lapped out of his mouth. Bitch. I wish I was dead. Man, if you're telling me I'm jacked up, I must be the walking dead. <laughs> he coughed. Don't make me laugh. It only hurts. In all my years of fighting with Cobra, and as many times as I dreamed about seeing him dead, I never expected to see the seven-foot monster so banged up. It wasn't quite as sweet as I envisioned it. I squinted my eyes and scratched some goop off the roof of my mouth. Where are we? <clears throat> Where do you think, you dumb fuck? The cloth is real, and your pyro ex-girlfriend is working for them. Did you ever stop to think for a second that I ran things the way I did for a reason? <clears throat> Shit, Reynolds. Even your stupid albino ass should have seen this coming. What happened? The last thing I remember was Tahoe and your muscles dead. I heard some of the guards giving props to each other for shooting his head off. Oh. How are you caught? Are you dense? <laughs> they were fed to these bastards by Dez and Copperhead. The snakes are gone. I saw. The knucklers are gone too. 
We were popped by those bitches. My eyesight started to reach full clarity. Cobra was not a sight for sore-ass eyes. Cuts and slices covered his body, and they were infected. For some reason, they weren't healing properly. By the time it took for the wounds to get infected, even his skull should have healed. As far as the power of healing went, Cobra usually regenerated at an alarming rate compared to the rest of us, as if his antibodies were in a constant spiral. His internal strength was directly related to his street strength. There were no others like him. Looking around our cells more closely, I saw each had a toilet, a sink, and a locker. Next to the plastic-covered pillows on each side was a Bible. There were no sheets on the rotten, molding mattresses that were secured into the corroded cots, which were bolted to the concrete floor. Next to my cot, like a bedpan, was a bucket full of blood and chum. The smell was swine. I grunted and edged my way off the bed, barely able to stand from the severe drubbing I took at the Battlesnake's compound. (laughs) Cobra sneezed. Fuck, he said, pressing his nose into the glass, trying to wipe. Essentially a quadriplegic, he reluctantly smeared snot all over his face. Need a tissue? I joked. You little bitch. A tooth fell out of his mouth and stuck to his lip. If I were over there, you'd already be dead. I guess it's convenient for me then, huh? I surveyed the cells further. The fronts were composed of metal bars. The back and sides opposite each were brick walls with metal bars between us. The bars themselves were spaced out about six inches apart. I could tell that there wasn't a whole lot of give, but it wasn't going to be impossible to escape from. Shit, Cobra. I'll be over there to unstrap you in a second. Now you haven't gotten out of here yet is beyond me. What are you doing, Reynolds? Cobra wiggled his head around, further drenching his face with sneeze. Dude, do they really think they can keep us in here with steel bars? These assholes need to do their homework on super strength and vampires. No, Reynolds, he said. Don't do it! I dropped my fingers between two of the bars. This is nothing. I can feel the give, Cobra. Reynolds, no! He coughed. Just as soon as I began to feel the bars bending, two giant infrared lamps slipped on directly outside the front of the room and lit up Cobras in my cell. The intensity sent me rushing backward against the far end of the cell. I landed back on my bed. Frantically, I searched for a blanket, a sheet, or any kind of shield. Coming up empty, I sank my face into the synthetic pillow and tried to bury the rest of my exposed skin into the mattress. I felt smoke rising from my shoulders. The smell of burnt flesh engulfed the room. This was much more powerful than the effects of regular sunlight on our skin. It was as if the sun were a mere mile from the earth. Trying to drown out the screams of Cobra's pain, I yelled to him over the deadly hum of the lamps. How long does it last? His screaming stopped as he passed out from shock. I crawled and rolled around my mattress like a salamander being chased in an attempt to avoid the light. I peered out from behind my pillow to see Cobra's convulsions shaking the glass plank he was secured to. Liquefied portions of his skin gobbed off the corners of the table. I shared his pain as my veins began boiling like I was being cooked inside out. Even with the pillow bound to my face, I felt my sensitive corneas adhering to my torched eyelids. Finally, the beams powered down. I hugged my pillow as I fell off the bed and rolled around on the floor, attempting to douse any flames on my skin. I grabbed the bucket of pig stuff and I began lathering my body like I was applying aloe to sunburn. My hull began to foam as I rolled around trying to stop the pain. I looked next door to Cobra, whose skin was clumping off his body like he was shedding. I guessed he was falling into cardiac arrest because I made out his booger decoration mixing with the blood he was vomiting. Then, he started beating his head against the table, probably to divert the pain from his back that smoldered and crusted. Breathing heavily, I stopped fidgeting around and reached into the bucket for what was left. I tossed it to the bars onto his back. Enough slop made it through the small bars to absorb and dampen much of the fire. Cobra's erratic breathing mellowed as the spasm slowed. 
After I was sure the worst was over and the cobra wasn't dying, I crept under the bed and passed out. That night they shut off the lights completely, except for, I counted, ten red motion detectors that continuously scanned both cells. I was hungry. I was hungry for heroin, but since I used my bucket of pig slop to save our lives, and because I was still recovering from my beatdown at the compound, I was much more in need of blood. A neon clock that centered in the back wall between us helped light up our cells. When the clock hit midnight, the looped, soothing female voice recited the Lord's Prayer. In the relative tranquility, I thought about bait and all the horror I had gotten her involved in. I pulled her ID out of my back pocket. Skyline Junior High, Peoria, Arizona. I only hoped that Pico took Tahoe's death at my disappearance as a signal to take her from the Batwangers and get out of Los Angeles. If the Wangers didn't turn her out, I feared somehow that Dez and whatever crew he was rolling with would get their hands on her. Most likely, Dez figured the cloth just killed us. If he and Copperhead had a brain to share between them, they would stay clear. It was pretty lame that the two most protected and revered bangers in Los Angeles ended up where Cobra and I were. I never should have let Dez hang out with Copperhead, and Cobra shouldn't have either. Rather than bringing our two syndicates together, they tore us inside out. We need heroin. I looked through the smoke that projected the red security beams. What did you say? Cobra was almost too faint to hear as he tried to speak. I didn't say shit. I must be hearing things. You should have heard what I told you. His tongue clicked around in his mouth. You want to listen to me next time? I've been in here a few more days than you. I know the deal. How are you feeling? How do you think I feel? <clears throat> he coughed. Damn it. I'm strapped down, you stupid white bitch. I ripped the cover off the Bible next to my bed and began brushing dead skin off my body. Even if you weren't, I think I could kick your ass. You messed up. Oof, he breathed. How long was I out before you woke me up? I asked, scraping the corners of my bucket for leftover blood. I took the scarce amount and rubbed it into my eyes, trying to get my eyeballs free from my eyelids. I haven't been keeping track. A few days. They kept you sedated with a slow drip of some kind of sedative. Water. Small amount of blood. They also run those high beams over there on low frequency to drain your energy. They never want you strong enough to get out of here. I'm not healing at all because they keep firing me up. A few days without heroin. There it was again. It was no surprise that I was hearing weird things considering my predicament, but this... This was different. As if my withdrawal was talking to me, I blinked my gooey eyes free. Why? Why don't they just kill us? He groaned. Exactly. I limped over to my sink and splashed warm water on my face. Then, I tilted my head back and swished some more water around my eyes. How did you end up on that table? <laughs> I'm tougher than you. They can't really keep me down with anything. From the get-go, they tried a couple different things that didn't do nothing. At one point, I ripped one of the guards' arms off. <laughs> That's when they brought in about ten assholes with cattle prods and started the tanning lights. After I was weak enough, they stuck me onto this table. I tried to pull a paper towel out of the dispenser next to my sink, but it was empty. Come on, I griped. I wiped my hands on my jeans and walked across the motion detectors. Don't worry, they don't do anything, he said. I think they're just monitoring our movement or studying us or some shit. I moved closer to him to get a bird's eye view. A portion of his brain was visibly absent. When did they scalp you? I asked. They didn't scalp me, bitch. 
Your little asshole friend and copperhead did this to me. They came at me like 40 deep. They fucked me up and left my body on the doorstep of this place with a note. That's when these psychos started in on me. I bent my neck and studied him. Hey, what are you looking at, Reynolds? Get back to bed. I conceded and returned to the mattress. I was happy he couldn't see himself because he was an awful specimen to observe. What are these clowns doing to us? I don't know. Saving us, maybe. The amplified Lord's prayer being piped into our cells grew louder. I tried to talk over the prayer. Why? I asked. Don't you know where you are, Reynolds? This is where you were born. Yeah, right, I was born in the streets. He coughed a little more and swallowed another loose tooth. You weren't born on those streets, fool. None of us were. We were all born here when we were kept alive in a coma until they thought we were ready to be on the streets. Whatever. How do you know all that? Because I'm the one who dumped most of you out there. I set up the territories. They made us. With some kind of experiment. I don't know much, but what I do know, you don't want to know. As unconvinced as I was, I couldn't help but believe him. It made sense in a lot of different ways, and it answered the most basic question of why didn't we remember being kids. Why? (laughs) I don't know. I just did as I was told. I rarely talked to anyone. I'd get a delivery time. I'd come out to the alley behind the church we're in right now and then go dump people on Skid Row or any shitty alley. If the kid looked queer, I'd dump him near you. If not, I'd dump him near me or just take him back. All I know. You're going to have to ask them. When did it stop? About 15 years ago. Well, how long have you been around, Cobra? Wait. Um, is there any chance I can call you something other than Cobra or King Cobra? I feel weird calling you that. I always have. His voice dropped. I ain't got no other name, bitch. That's the name I gave myself. It's just that... um, I slowed down to think through how to approach the lameness of the Battlesnake's name... He was nailed to a table. There was no better time. It seems kind of... comic booky. Obviously, it came from somewhere. Are you dumb, Reynolds? I'm not going to give you a history lesson. It's simple. It sounds like rattlesnakes. It sounds badass and it commands respect. Um, maybe in the 70s, I said. What did you just say? You heard me. If you guys are such hardcore Rastas, why wouldn't your name be, like, the Judah Lions or something? He paused for a minute and confessed. We weren't always Rastafarians. In the 70s, we wanted to be more about black power and that shit. We wore berets with snakes on the front. Then, why not the Black Mambas or something? He paused again. After that, we rolled into the black exploitation, Petey Wheat Straw shit. I tilted my head. Hey, I saw that movie. I named my dogs after Leroy and Skillet, those two comedians from San Francisco. Son. You named your dogs after black people, fucking cracker ass. What does it matter now, asshole? Copperhead and your boys killed them. Every one of my gang is an adult bitch. There ain't no boys. What's your problem? Don't you think we should be worrying about more than me naming my dogs after comedians? You started this shit. With the battle snakes. Deal? The whole thing is so cheesy, dude. You better check yourself, bitch. You're named after a brand of cigarettes, and your gang name reminds me of a bunch of skinny little white assholes jerking off in a circle. What about Herman? What about Herman? What, motherfucker? I pointed at him. You must be out of your goddamn mind, Reynolds. Shut up and try to get some sleep. 
They're gonna come down here tomorrow to fucking feed us. If we're lucky, they'll tell us what we want to know. Battlesnakes. Weak. He coughed up the tooth he swallowed earlier, but rather than spitting it out, he sucked on it like a throat lozenge. I'm not even about to listen to you anymore, fool. I'm also going to kick the living shit out of you if we ever get out of here. Good night, Herman. I yelled over the Lord's Prayer. You're a dead-ass bitch, Reynolds. Dead-ass bitch. Good night, RJ. Good night. Weird, creepy voice. Chapter 18 Clerics The Lord's Prayer finally concluded its broadcast at 6 a.m. Our alarm clock was a quick flash of the sun lamps. Look out, Reynolds. Damn it! I tried to take cover, but my skin was still attacked by the UV rays. Come on, man! <laughs> Herman laughed. It only lasted a few seconds, and I rushed to the sink and splashed some water on my chest. You could have warned me about the wake-up call, dick. Yeah, but I have to suck it up every morning because I don't have the luxury of a pillow to hide behind like a little girl. Besides, I'm getting used to it. Damn. <laughs> you should have seen your face. Forgetting that the custodian didn't refill my paper towel dispenser, I tugged on the lever only to come up empty. There ain't no towels. They know better than to give you a bum's blanket. I punched in the dispenser. Obviously, they were never going to give me anything to dry my hands on so my jeans wouldn't have to do. Hey, Reynolds, check this out. Herman closed his left eye and inhaled. Slowly. His right eye began squirming up the table back into its socket. With one last pop, it went back in. For the record, it went in crossed, but at least it was in its home. Impressed, I asked, How'd you do that? They didn't knock my eye out. I did it myself. Figured the worse I looked, the easier they'd be on me. They are religious folk, after all. He smiled through the pain, obviously congratulating himself for his cleverness. The sound of a bank vault door being cranked open down the walkway from our cells was followed by the sound of combat boots clomping their way on the cement toward us. I jumped back onto the bed like a little boy playing video games after bedtime and closed my eyes. That's not gonna do you any good, fool. They've been watching us all night and all morning. You're so stupid sometimes. They know you're awake, so get up and get ready for breakfast. My stomach boomed. What's for breakfast? Denny's? Pig slop. The same stuff you wasted last night. I didn't waste it, Herman. I used it to save your life. My name ain't Herman, he growled. Good morning, boys. I peeked out from under my pillow. Two guards dressed in Gestapo vestments stood in front of our cells. One of them held two buckets and an IV bag. The other held a cattle prod and a gat. The guard with the gun leaned up to my cell bars. I know you're awake, white guy. That's a pretty cool tattoo you have there. I rushed the front of my cell but restrained myself before I reached it. The guard with the buckets and the IV snickered. Well, he must be confused and thinks you're the Riddler, Tim. The other guard chimed in. Go for it, junkie. Tim nudged him with his elbow. Yeah. Do you need to be reminded of what happened last night, demon? Just do what they say, Reynolds. Take a good look at me. Herman rolled his eyes around. It's just a matter of time before you end up like this. 
Even though his advice didn't necessarily calm me, I was reminded that both of us were in this predicament because of my awful decisions. I looked at both priests. Demon? What are you talking about? I figured if I played along, they might cough up some information. Not Tim walked toward me. You're a demon who shouldn't be alive. I inched my face by extending my neck as close to the bars without setting off the sun lamps. What's your definition of a live friend? I'm walking and talking, aren't I? Real Tim jumped back into the conversation. You're walking now. We'll see how long that lasts. Herman sighed. Christ, just let them give you some food, Reynolds. Face it, your tattoo is gay. Let's move on. I snapped my fingers at Herman. Wait a second. I deserve an explanation. I looked back at real Tim and not Tim. Why are we here? Well, you'll find out soon enough, demon. After patting real Tim on the neck, not Tim went back to Herman's cell and hit a button on a car alarm key ring. The cell door slid open. Cautiously, he walked in and exchanged the IV bag on the stand next to Herman's legs on the table. Damn, you stink, Cobra. Herman lay crippled as the adventurous guard moved close behind the Rasta's head. Check this out. He put his finger in Herman's brain, causing his legs to jolt. Dance. Both guards laughed. All Herman could do was lay there and try to enjoy the pig's blood they fed him intravenously. Not Tim exited the cell, clicked his keychain again, and then walked back toward me. He pressed another button and a small doorway opened up at the front base of my cell. Real Tim observed my curiosity and fired up his cattle prod. Keep staring at it. Even if you broke every bone in your body, you'll never be able to get through that opening. He tapped the UV lamps behind him with the prod. Not Tim walked up to the hole, dropped his bucket and kicked it in toward my feet. The top of the food bin skimmed the edge of the hatch, but it didn't trigger the sun lamps. Satisfied he'd fed the stray dog, he clicked the keychain one last time and the cubbyhole closed. Max says, have a nice breakfast, real Tim added. The two priests bumped arms again. Hey, Cobra. Tell him who Fat Mac is. After shooting me sarcastic, sad faces complete with pantomimed tear rubbing, real Tim and not Tim yucked their way back down the hall. I think I might have heard a high five when they reached the door at the end of the hall. Herman, what kind of priests are these guys? Some kind of religious militia? Don't call me Herman anymore. I picked up my bucket and began shoveling guts into my mouth. Well, since I've made it clear that I refuse to call you King Cobra, get over it and deal with it. Ugh. What are you going to do about it anyway? As the energy dripped back into his body via the blood bag, the crust on his back started to heal, becoming a taffy-like yellow pus. I already told you, Reynolds. They're the cloth. We're in a basement of the goddamn church. I think it's where we were born. I flipped a morsel of pig liver out of my cell and out of Herman's table. He snorted and inched his head up. With the aid of his forehead and nose, he slipped it into his mouth. Look, he said as he consumed the food with his near toothless gums. I don't know the whole story, but... I'm almost sure this is why we're the way we are. I threw him another piece, hoping that if I gave him more treats, he would tell me more. And? Using the same head-to-nose trick, he inched the food into his mouth. And nothing. That's all I know. Then why didn't you ever tell anybody, Herman? I did. He chomped on the pig, trying to prevent choking on big pieces that he couldn't decompose without teeth. The old man, Pico. He knows just as much as me. He might know other things. More, please. More what? I held a long string of intestine up to his face. Rather than play SeaWorld with me, he just closed his eyes. Feeling bad, I threw it to him. 
Unfortunately, it landed on his brain. Oh, shit, Herman, I'm sorry. He bent his head sideways and tossed the food like a burger patty from the top of his head onto the table. He extended his tongue, latched onto it, and rolled it up into his mouth. I actually didn't think he knew anything else, so I switched subjects. Do you think that clock is right? Probably not. But who cares? They're giving me some kind of lobotomy over here. I walked over to my toilet and looked for a seat. There wasn't one. I doubt if they knew toilets were one of my favorite weapons, but their ability to vamp-proof my cell was an A-plus effort nonetheless. Yeah, I can see that, Herman. I pulled my pants down and sat on the cold rim. Don't you dare take a shit, Reynolds. What do you want me to do? I haven't gone since I got here. I dropped a big loaf, a clean exit, and shot water back up my sphincter like a trailer park bidet. The splash felt good. Herman closed his eyes. Like I want to see your little white man dick. Sorry, I'm not a seven foot tall black dude, asshole. Shit, where's the toilet paper? (laughs) You're going to have to use your hand. (laughs) I looked up to a camera on the wall. Hey, I need some TP in here. I'm not going to give you any paper, Reynolds. Use your hand and then wash it off after. I eyeballed Herman's colostomy bag resting on the floor next to his bed. At least when I lived on Skid Row, there was always something to wipe with. Making a sour face by scrunching his eyes and nose together, Herman tried to avoid my stench. Uh, Deal with it. I waited until I was finished and then wiped myself. I flushed. Walked over to the sink and used almost half of the pink juice in the soap dispenser. My hand smelled like free grooming at Incontinence Dog Park. So, who is this fat Mac I keep hearing about? Herman relaxed his scrunched face. God damn, you stink. He's their leader. He was the only one I've spoken to before I got caught. I took some innards out of my bucket walked back to my cot and then placed the pieces over my seared eyes like cucumbers. So, let me get this straight. Mac is the leader of a crew of lunatic priests. Come on, that's almost as asinine as a gang of pothead vampires called the Battlesnakes. I told you where that came from, Reynolds. Not really. You told me a bunch of stories about Black Panthers and Superflies. Now... You're telling me a crazy story about us being part of some experiment. Do you even have any idea where you come from, or are you just throwing bullshit my way to annoy me? I know where I'm from, bitch. The only one of us that's older than me, and knows more, is the old gimp. Did Pico save you too? Hell no. I didn't even know he existed until I saw an old-ass man running with your junkie crew. Look... Reynolds, we exist. We do drugs and we kill people. What more is there to know? I don't even care what I am or where I come from right now. All I do care about is being jacked up on this table with my head cracked open. The steel door latched open at the end of the hall and then closed again. Those pricks again? I asked. Herman licked his lips. We should be so lucky. A single pair of soft-soled shoes squeaked down the hall. They didn't clomp like the boots the guards were wearing. They stomped directly in front of my cell. Hello, Mr. Reynolds. The priest began. Low lights. He then whispered into a lavalier microphone hanging near the center of the white square on the collar of his standard-issue clerical uniform. The sun lamps hummed to life. They weren't on a high enough frequency to burn me, but they were powerful enough to deplete all my energy. I rubbed the pig parts on my eyes. Although the lights didn't bother me too much, I didn't have enough energy to get up and take cover. And the warbling heat massaged me almost into a daze. Open cell, he said into the mic. The cell door popped open. He grabbed a wooden chair from the hall and dragged it into my cell. 
Having difficulty moving, I took my fleshy tanning specks off. The priest pulled the chair into the center of my room and pointed to it. Do you mind? He asked. Whatever, I said, unsuccessfully recovering my eyes. As the pig part slid down the sides of my face, my arms loosened and dropped to my sides. He put out his hand to shake. Well, Mr. Reynolds, it is a pleasure to meet you as an adult. Too exhausted to shake, I said. It's not mutual. He lifted the lavalier back up to his mouth. Increase lights. Feed Bible. Per his demands, the lights intensified slightly, and passages from the Bible blared from the speakers. I tried to roll under my pillow for cover, but I was too weak to move. He sat down in the chair and plucked an apple out of his pocket and brushed it off. Taking a bite, he said, Oh, I'm not offended that you won't shake my hand. I understand. The only thing I wanted him to understand was that if I weren't incapacitated, I would strangle, mutilate, and kill him. My name is Father Martin Micketeer. Most people call me Fat Mac. I turned my head to get a closer look at him. Mac was a small man in his fifties or sixties. He had slicked back hair that mixed reds and browns with gray highlights. The hair tried valiantly to cover odd thinning patches all over his head. His eyes blinked constantly and were submerged in a strange population of freckles that fused together, almost forming a birthmark. The pigmentation blotches created a raccoon-like mask on his face. His bulbous nose started small at the bridge and ended in two huge nostrils that opened and closed erratically. It was a bizarre tick for someone who presented himself so calmly. He had extremely slight lips, which was unfortunate because his teeth were chipped away and riddled with gaps. Below the burst dam that was his mouth sat his butt chin that swirled into a repulsive scab. Still lower... His liver-spotted turkey neck sprouted from his priest outfit. Covered from that point to the floor, I didn't have to use my imagination to think about what other horrors were under the cloth. He pulled a rubber hood over his head to protect him from the rays. Hot enough for you? Fuck off! I squeezed out as I tried to shield myself from the sun lamps in the shadow of his oblong head. God bless you, my son, he said standing up and making the sign of the cross. His eyes twinkled as they followed the movements of his hand. Do you know who I represent? He took his seat. The artificial sunlight blew across my body like an oscillating fan, blowing fire across my exposed flesh. Cloth, I said. He patted me on the leg, deepening my blistering pain. Correct. We are indeed men of the cloth. Did your adversary... He produced a small notepad from a pocket as he took another bite from the now smoking apple. Oh, oh, here it is. Herman. (laughs) Did Herman tell you that? He looked over at Herman and waved. Hello, Herman. That's a much better name. Don't you think? He chomped on the apple and licked the roof of his mouth. Having trouble reading through the sweat that rolled into his eyes, he produced a pair of reading glasses from yet another pocket. As he wiped off the lenses, he rested them on the end of his nose. Herman stayed silent. The light was still dim in his cell, and he wanted to keep it that way. Ah, oh, you seem curious as to where you come from. More so than anyone else like you. Well, this is it. He raised his arms in praise. This is where you were brought into the world. I fell in and out of consciousness wishing that I weren't subdued because I did want answers. This joker was pulling my dick to prove that he was in control. I can tell that you're tired from all the excitement, so I'll let you rest until you have more time to let this information sink in. As he stood up, wiped some sweat off his cheeks and littered his apple core on the ground of my cell, he closed his little notebook and placed it back in his pocket. Then, he took off the reading glasses, folded them, and placed them in the breast pocket on the front of his uniform. From the same pocket, he pulled out a bottle of holy water. Pressing to overcome my nausea, I felt my gums getting weak and my teeth loosening. (laughs) 
Holy water doesn't do shit, old man, I said. He unscrewed the top of the bottle. Oh, I'm afraid this isn't holy water, my son. Excitedly, he accidentally knocked over his chair. It's hydrochloric acid. He began reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I grabbed the side of the bed, too weak to pull myself out of the way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Again, he made the sign of the cross. This time, however, he poured the acid, starting at the top of my chest and traveling all the way down to my pelvis. I didn't cry. I didn't move. I was nearly paralyzed. The only movement I made was to close my eyes as he opened me up like a Ziploc bag. Give us this day our daily bread, he continued, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As he dug into the last portion of the verse, he switched direction, going now from nipple to nipple. I felt the water down acid eating my skin away, like he dropped a nest full of parasites on me and hung a sign under my chin that said, Welcome. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. He threw a syringe on the floor next to my cot. I didn't open my eyes, but I faintly heard him sashay his soft shoes out of my cell. I felt the ground rumble as the bars closed behind him. A piercing drone of pain tickled my ears and overloaded my brain. Amen, he concluded the prayer. Lights off, gospel off. Mr. Reynolds, there's blood and methadone in the syringe. Fucking meth methadone. My animal instincts demanded that I jump off the bed and rip his balls off, but my spent body didn't respond. Instead... I slipped into a comatose state from a combination of the lights and the acid. My mind spoke louder than the fury, too, telling me that if I rolled onto my side or sat up that my guts would splash all over the floor. The lights went off, and the motion sensor zapped on. (laughs) Damn, son, Herman laughed. You just got fucked the fuck up. Chapter 19 Watchers It was a rough heel. I lay on my cot for endless hours, trying to gather enough energy to reach the floor and grab the syringe. Not long after my attack, real Tim and not Tim came into my cell, hooked me up to an IV like Herman's and whispered threats into my ear. Making things worse, vomit from my heroin withdrawal burped up out of my mouth and landed in the gaping caverns cut into my chest from the acid. Every time I stretched my arm out to grab the syringe, I felt my insides waddle around, almost spilling over my skin. The withdrawal fevers didn't help my situation and were a constant reminder that I needed the heroin to survive. How does it feel, Reynolds? Herman badgered every time he saw the needle eluding my reach. I shook frantically. I grabbed onto the sides of the cot to steady the bowl containing my ingredients so none of them escaped. I was positive that everything would rejuvenate over time, but since I had never been in a situation like this, I felt it best to keep everything as stable as possible and intact while my shell pressed forward to mend itself. I never felt withdrawal symptoms before. If I needed the fix, I went and took it. I stole drugs from dealers and I took their lives to satisfy my needs. Even when I rummaged around in the gutter, I always somehow managed to score. 
I don't know exactly when my hunger began, but once I was aware of my needs, I smelled the heroin and sought it out. I was now in my most desperate moment, and my existence seemed frail and useless compared to the power of the drugs, the torture from the acid, and the constant exposure to the sun lamps. Herman laughed away. <laughs> How does it feel, Reynolds? In between his bout with consciousness, he flung insults at me simply because he knew I could hear them, but was unable to respond. To him, even as fragmented as he was, this was his way of reminding me that all problems were my fault. Every couple of hours that passed, I'd run a finger up and down and across the wound, checking for progress. The hours became days. Fat Mac didn't pay us another visit. Our only visitors continued to be real Tim and not Tim. They came into our cells, made jabs at us, and switched out our IV and colostomy bags. They didn't bother dressing any of our wounds. About two days after Fat Mac left, the Tims upped the sedatives on my blood bag. Either they were concerned about my slow heal, or they just wanted me nice and loopy so they could hatch a more nefarious strike against me. The drip from the IV was slow, but it was comforting as it bombed into my bloodstream, only to be instantaneously devoured by the first lucky part of my body that needed it most. It was a seemingly never-ending game to them. They laughed and drank wine while they flicked the sun lamps on and off. There wasn't a damn thing I could do about it. I vaguely remembered a game that the Tims played called Fireball, where they would turn on the lights and see which one of us stayed responsive the longest. Whomever picked the loser had to drink. They stopped playing the game after only a few matches because whichever one of them picked Herman always won. I felt like I was hovering above my bed like some out-of-body experience. I was floating over the shit pile that was my life. Feeling the light bouncing off me, I would scratch at my butt, making sure that Bates' ID was still there. It was my single motivation to escape. Before I met her, I never felt things like guilt or pain. I didn't know whether or not that was some sort of blessing or curse. Thinking about her made me feel nothing but guilt. On the third day after my punishment at the hands of Fat Mac, my gash had healed just enough for me to get at the methadone syringe. Without sitting up on my bed, I carefully ripped off a shred of denim from the side of my jeans and tied off my arm. <laughs> Is it worth it, low life? Herman yelled over to me. I tested the durability of my chest cavity and its contents. My arms trembled as I bent it to an upright position. Terrified, I started to prop myself up, attempting to keep my sternum as flat as possible. I used my free arm as a safety net just in case important organs manifested themselves into a wave and overflowed. Remaining vigilant but anxious, I let the brace of my arm down. The cross on my chest fizzled and oozed. Although raw, it was secure enough. As I arched myself slightly further upward, I relaxed my shoulders. If I even yawned, I would have sprung open like a jack-in-the-box. Herman carried on. Hey, hillbilly, they did you a favor. They torched that stupid-ass Batman ink. <laughs> you should thank them. <laughs> I sunk the needle into my arm. The blood in the syringe was room temperature and the taste was putrid. Nothing like the fresh blood hijacked from a beating heart. I felt sour in my body like I was just giving my dead veins a transfusion with urine. My eyes rolled toward Herman's cell. I wish it was worth it. This isn't even heroin. It's fucking methadone. Ask for heroin. The voice wasn't going away. I'm hearing a voice, I confessed. Yeah, I'm hearing your voice right now, and it's pissing me off. Not like that, dude. I'm hearing a voice that keeps telling me to find heroin. <laughs> what the hell does it sound like? I don't know, like a weird, scratchy whisper. Oh, you dumbass Reynolds. <laughs> he laughed. 
That's just the gooch. What? What's that? It's the bully you never see, telling your dumb ass what to do. I think it's withdrawal. Ah, oh, sure, it's that too. On that TV show Different Strokes, Arnold was always pushed around by some big-ass bully that we never ever saw. That was the gooch. Arnold was always bitching and moaning about the gooch. He was always the scapegoat. The reason for all his problems. That's really fucking stupid, Herman. You sure about that? What's it telling you right now? Is it telling you to get some heroin? Even though we're all fucked up in that cell? I didn't respond. Sucks for you. Pot ain't addictive. Ain't no gooch running my life. I curled my dry tongue inside my mouth as I tried to enjoy my fix. Cut the shit, Herman. I ain't cutting any shit, fool. We're both here because of you. If you would have listened to me even once, we wouldn't be here. You bring me one washed-up actress bitch that burns my house down, then you bring me another little bitch who steals my drugs and my money. Then, the first bitch comes back and kills everyone I know. They didn't play any part in it. It was just me and Des. Bullshit, Reynolds. We had people following her back and forth from your drop. And <clears throat> you think that I'm stupid? I knew she was involved the night you came over and sat there, looking me straight in the face, telling me that the cops didn't have any drugs. I said no coke. Dumbass. We made sure it was heroin because we knew you just couldn't pass up an opportunity to rip me off. Look around you. Can't you see they're beating us down for their enjoyment, fool? This isn't a mystery, Sherlock. We are two in a long-ass line of vampires who go missing every year. From the day we were born. All we've been is a big experiment. Herman raised his head and propped his chin on the table. He spat a loogie into my cell. Fuck you too, Herman. You set us up for what reason? Because you hate us? Why didn't you just kill us? We played right into your test. Are you proud that you proved a junkie would take a duffel bag full of heroin? The list just keeps getting longer every time you call me that name. I've kicked your ass more than once, and when the time comes, I'm going to finish the job. Ah, oh, I can't wait. He scratched his chin on the table. Since we're talking about your bitches, that pyro the habit, she's the one who dragged your raggedy Andy ass in here. She also came into my cell and shoved a hunting knife into my armpit. I can't even tell you how much I wish I could go back to that night you brought her over. I would have shoved both of you into my meat grinder, ate you, shit you out, and, <clears throat> and then fed you to the rest of your wankster-ass friends. I hope she was one awesome lay, Reynolds, you D-list star fucker. I reached sideways and dug into my bucket for a piece of life. I never banged her. Herman's eyes lit up. Oh, well... Mm, let me get this straight. You brought some psycho-ass bitch up into my shit, let her burn my house down, and then I end up here with you, and you don't even have a decent anal story for me? <coughs> uh, mm, you never even dipped it? Stupid Reynolds. You never pay attention to what's going on right under your own nose because all you can think about is drugs. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Because Copperhead told me that every one of them tapped that ass on that little bait girl. Piss off, Herman. <laughs> oh, you're kidding me. This is a comedy club in here. I'm serious, fool. You were the joke of the town. Des came over to our place and showed us videos of him and his partners banging on that little girl in every single position you could imagine. All she did was sit there and frown. She had dead-ass eyes because she was all faded from the junk. Copperhead was in the videos, too. This. 
<laughs> this is priceless. I rubbed the scar tissue on my torso. What do you mean? Des was showing you videos. Oh man, Reynolds, how do you think we were sure you took the drugs from the cops? <laughs> Damn, that little bitch confessed the day after Halloween. Fuck! <sighs> I screamed, folding both my arms over my chest to hold myself together. With my foot that was dangling off the bed, I kicked my bucket to the bars at the front of my cell. The lights blazed on. Gun shy to fully stand up, I tipped onto my cot on my back. Being mindful of my body, I rolled toward the back wall. Using my ass, my thighs, and what power I had in my arms, I propped myself up the mattress. Enjoy the sun, asshole! I screamed as the light singed the tip of my tongue. There's nothing you can do now, King fucking Cobra! He didn't scream like before. Meaning either he was developing a tolerance to the sun lamp or he didn't want me to hear how weak he'd become. After a while, the lamps powered down and a smoky mess from Herman's cell wafted toward me. <sighs> Remember, Reynolds, he snorted. I'm keeping a list over here. I'm just the messenger. You and I both know they ain't gonna let either of us die in here. Like I said, they need us for something. If... <clears throat> if... And when I get the chance to square up with you, it'll be much worse than anything that happened to that little girl. And when I finally get my hands on that bitch that burned my house, fucking forget it. I snuck out from behind my mattress. His seriousness made me realize that our survival was going to be decided not by us or our willingness to work together or apart. Our fate was in the hands of the cloth. The neckband tugged at my skin as it caught one of the exposed springs from the bed. After the smoke cleared, I looked into Herman's cell. He winked. It only made sense. If Cobra and I were ever going to see the light of day, scratch that, the outside world, at night, again, we would have to come together against a far more dangerous gang than the snakes and the knucklers combined. His voice grew louder and more powerful. It happened, Reynolds. We all hit that little girl. What do I have to gain by making that shit up? <laughs> we had a hell of a time laughing at you back at that compound. <laughs> I scratched at where the faction tattoo had been. The only thing left was pus. <laughs> we should talk about building up our own cartel, he babbled on. You know, so when we get out of here, we can make our own dollars. You and me. He nodded his head, coaxing me to agree. I'm in. If we get out of here, we work together. He winked at me again. How bad do you want Des? I thought for a second. There isn't even a scale that can weigh that question. Then I turned the question to him. How bad do you want Copperhead? Oh, you don't even know. Using a combination of budget sign language and camouflaged gang slangs that we both knew, Herman and I formed an alliance. We veiled it in discussions about the big plans we had after we got out of jail. Hey, Reynolds. Yeah. That was a pretty dope move with the mattress. I didn't even see you break it off the frame. Flattered, I smiled. <laughs> it was pretty nice, wasn't it? I realized I was scratching away at the bindings the entire time I was healing without really paying attention. Right before I kicked the bucket, I noticed that both sides of the mattress were free. I pressed my mouth up to one of the bricks behind my bed that I knew hid one of the many pinhole cameras used to observe us and yelled... Okay, you dumb Catholic cunts. <laughs> we want to know what you want.
Chapter 20 Jezebels As the hell's bells of the Lord's Prayer invaded our dreams, I heard the door at the end of the hall disengage and open. Herman slept, and even if his hearing was fully intact, I doubted that he was interested in any late-night booty calls. The usual sound of combat boots and soft shoes coming down the hall was replaced by the heel-to-toe tap dance of stilettos. Halfway to our cells, the clicking was interrupted by the sound of a tumble. Shit, the female voice whispered. She then broke into laughing hysteria. I heard her get up, brush herself off, and stabilize against the brick wall. Unbelievably, the process of a junkie picking herself up from a fall and making herself presentable without dozing off took an unsubstantial 55 seconds. Somewhat shuffling, probably because of a skinned knee, she made her way to the front of my cell. Hey, RJ, she spat with her perpetually laryngitic voice. The habit stood around 5 foot 8 in her spiked heels. For some dumb reason, she was wearing a nun's habit. Her blonde hair was stringy and pushed behind her ears, revealing very little inside the emptiness of her pale blue eyes. She was blessed with naturally mesmerizing eyes, but since she chose the path of waste, her black pupils blanketed the color. Whenever I saw her, I expected her to say, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. When she scratched at the track marks under her robe, her shoulders compressed, causing her spine to bend. I don't know if she had scoliosis or if the constant cold spins from the drugs made her bend around like a hunchback. Her makeup was so poorly applied it looked like someone literally took a clown, grabbed it by the hair, and pounded its made-up face onto hers. She looked thinner than I remembered. The only part of her appearance that seemed to be applied with any TLC was her lipstick. But since it was clumped on to conceal an outbreak of herpes in the corners, her lips could never be described as kissable. Punchable? Yes, but only if the fist was thoroughly disinfected and sanitized before and after contact was made. She grabbed her outfit at her thighs, pulled it out at the sides, and curtsied. Sadly... Her attempt to look like a lady appeared more like two anorexic weasels chasing each other around a scratching post. Do you like my outfit? I didn't get off my cot. I lay there, shooting knives at a busted up face with my eyes. You get it, RJ? It's a habit. A nun's habit. She fell against the bars to steady herself and exhale like she just competed in a caber-tossing tournament. I would storm the bars and slurp her into my cell piece by piece if I didn't know that the UV lamps would flip on and give Herman a fireman's wake-up call. However, I had no interest in touching that pile of contagion. I yawned. What do you want, Habit? Come on, RJ, she giggled. Is that any way to greet your long-lost girlfriend? Don't you want my autograph? Her tone stung my ears. And heart. It reminded me that not only did I never bed her, but that she used me solely for drugs. Her time on this planet was limited to being a price-slashed knockoff of Nancy Spungen. I should have killed her when I lived at her house with her, long before she burned down the original Battlesnakes compound. If I ever had anything written about me on a gravestone, it would have to say something about my inability to read females. First it was the habit, and then it was bait. It seemed unfair that the bitch was standing in front of me, alive, while somewhere bait was enduring some type of torture. All I could hope for was that Pico was doing right in getting her away from Nomi and the wangers, who wouldn't think twice about handing her over to Dez. I got out of bed. I made my way toward the front of the cell, wary of the threshold that triggered the lights. She backed away from me. Get her, Reynolds, Herman said. I can suffer through the lights. Kill that little washed up bitch. I didn't. I rubbed my eyes. I burned down your fucking house, I confessed to her. She thought for a minute. 
As I figured, she forgot that I lived in her secret heroin den. Then her eyes lit up. <sighs> Good. I'm not getting residuals like I used to. I can collect the insurance money. Totally forgot that place even existed. I thought you would have stopped paying the mortgage. Thanks. Oh, I wouldn't be thanking me. When they open that place up, they're going to find a shitload of remains buried in the floorboards. Good thing I don't have any record with the cops. Even better, everyone knows who you are. <sighs> Whatever. She felt quiet for a minute. No one knows who I am anymore. What do you want? I asked her. She smirked and scratched her arms more furiously under the robe. I just wanted to show you my outfit, she repeated. Get it? Her eyes swam with the effect of the heroin. Yes, I get it. It's stupid. Please kill her, you soft ass, Herman said. I said, what do you want? Why are you here? Struggling, she stood up, breaking off her heel in the process. You're an asshole. She bent down and kicked her shoe off. I turned around and headed back to my cot. How did you get in here? Realizing that she had the upper hand because I wasn't going to kill her, she came closer to the bars and picked up her shoe. They let me in to talk to you. They gave me all the security shit because I helped them find you. They know about our history and they... They figured I could convince you. <sighs> Herman scoffed. She threw her nun's habit over her head and started scraping at her inner thighs with her broken heel. Her arms were beyond blotchy and black and blue from collapsed veins. Her left arm, her preferred shooting arm, looked like a tattooed sleeve of ominous thunderstorm clouds. I came to the conclusion that she was less of an asset to the cloth at that point than she was a roadblock in their effort to get us to do their bidding. I felt kind of bad for her. Sure, she led them to us. But what was next for her? I wiped my nose on the synthetic pillow. Why would you lead them to us? Who are these guys? What the hell do they want? She tugged away at the skin on her arms and legs with the heel so hard that she started bleeding in numerous places. Usually. I quite enjoy the smell of blood. Her blood smelled like a sulfur mine and celluloid burned up inside an old movie projector. Heroin had not only killed her mind, it also digested her inside straight into her soul. She was the next childhood actress waiting in line to one day get back on top. If Hollywood history foretold when that would be, her star wouldn't shine again until the day she died. Only then would her fans remember how great she was. She's just another worthless junkie, Herman said, dismissing the conversation. He definitely doubted she could deliver any insight to our captivity. She stomped crookedly on one broken heel over to the front of Herman's cell. You sure didn't feel I was too worthless when I burned down your house or when I killed all those assholes inside. That's right. I turned them inside out the last time I went over there. You ruined my career, you motherfucker. I had it all. Herman rattled the table, trying to break out of the straps, cuffs, and chains that clamped him down. The habit ran her finger down one of his bars. What's the matter? He turned his head away from her to the back of his cell. Don't worry, girl. This ain't over. Not even close. Just so you know, the battle snakes didn't kill anyone when we burnt down that set. You killed my brothers. I'll never forget that. She shivered. I don't know if she was being theatrical or just a junk rat. Ooh, she sang. What are you going to do? Are you going to beat me with the leftover body parts of your gang? She clomped back to my cell like she was an uneven bar stool. 
They aren't going to kill you, RJ. She pulled the nun's habit back over herself. I think they plan to rehabilitate you or something. I sat up against the bars on the back wall next to my bed. Rehabilitate me. Are you sure that's what they want? Something like that. The scraping with her heel resumed and made its way to her neck and big hickey near her jugular. I don't know. I wasn't paying attention or anything like that. You never do, I said, frustrated. You should have paid attention to your agent before you got kicked off TV. She pointed back to Herman. I lost my show because this motherfucker destroyed it. Tired of playing charades with a dope fiend, I asked one final time. So, again, what do we owe the pleasure of this enlightening visit, Habit? She ran her finger over her lips and soothed the bedrock in her voice. I wanted to see you, my little RJ. Why? Because I haven't seen you since I got back from rehab in Malibu. These priest guys paid for it. They said they may be able to get me on some TBN show. I see it was successful. And here I was wishing you'd fallen off the earth or died from an overdose. Is that where you went after you torched the Battlesnake's compound? You realize that they came really close to killing me for that, right? Where did you go after that? I don't know. I did a couple porns. Herman rotated his head back to her. Get the fuck out of here. I've been tortured enough. She picked a piece of crust out of the top of her nostril and flung it in Herman's direction. I stood back up and paced my cell with my head down, evaluating her claims. Wait, wait, wait. So, you really did all this? Orchestrated this elaborate revenge? Because you aren't a star anymore. I pointed to Herman. Blood vessels popped in his eyes, creating clotted tears. You burned down his compound and killed his friend thereby leading him to set me up with the cops a year later, then landing both of us in this fucking jail to be tortured? I stopped and swayed my head back to her. All of this. Because you aren't a star anymore. I hesitated for a second and then rushed toward her. As predicted, the lights didn't blaze on. Killer Reynolds, kill that junkie whore! Somewhat prepared for my reaction, the habit pushed herself out of my reach as I tried to snatch a strand of her fried hair. Again, she lost her balance because of her uneven shoe. She trembled as she pushed herself further and further from my reach. She seemed more surprised that the cloth wasn't protecting her than she was at my reaction. She scanned the room for the lights to zap me. She was worthless to the cloth. She was nothing but a dry, smelly bottomless sinkhole to dispose of needles and pour shit into. You could still turn on a standard cable channel to watch her show, but the canned laughter seemed all too fitting a mockery of what she'd become. Another Hollywood nobody. She thumped on the wall at her back, not taking her eyes off me. Knowing her depth perception was beveled and warped, she feared the dangers of stumbling an inch or two out of her safe zone. As she scooted her can up the wall, she continued to knock. I want to leave now, she cried. She looked toward the speakers or cameras in the sky, trying to get the attention of her comrades. Still unsure of her location as to how it pertained to my reach, she glued herself to the wall as she sidestepped away. As soon as she reached the end of my cell, she dashed to the exit, sounding like a peg leg fast breaking on a basketball court. As she reached the door and clutched the handle, she hollered back. You're an abortion, RJ. A goddamn abortion. The lovely music turned off as it had every day. However, we weren't greeted with the routine morning dose of artificial vitamin D. Nonetheless, I was prepared... I had gotten in the practice of beating the lights every morning. Seemingly bored by our predicament, Herman yawned. 
You can come up from behind your mattress, Reynolds. I don't think they're going to hit us anymore. Trying to play it cool rather than continuing to cower, I appended the mattress back onto the frame by using both hands. I might have even flexed. I dusted my hands off against each other like I had done something productive. All in a pussy day's work, I suppose. Why are you fronting like you just did something? You blew it! I sat back down on the bed and cradled the back of my skull with my hands. The lacerations on my sternum were almost fully healed, and my body was beginning to feel cleansed from heroin. I ignored his badgering. Why are you saying stuff like frontin'? You're an educated man. Enough of the thug life talk. It's only you and me in here. Got nothing to prove. Knowing I was right and his mobster facade was useless inside, he simply said, Whatever. Do you think the lights might be broken? Herman coughed and wiped his face on the table. <clears throat> the lights aren't broken. It's back to more cat and mouse shit. I shot him a glance and noticed that his body was noticeably more intact than it had been in weeks. He was starting to look normal again, and less like a melting candle. Seriously, why didn't you kill her, Reynolds? You should be thanking me, asshole. I pointed to the front of our cells. No lights. I can stand the lights, he said, and I'm not thanking you for anything. Ever. You brought that white trash bitch around to begin with. You brought a card-carrying member of the KKK into my house. He twirled his arms around, showing off his cell. You're to blame for this. I jumped from my bed. Herman, holy shit, your restraints. What about them? They're off, I said, pointing at his body. Taking a second to adjust, he put his hands in front of his face. Then, he scratched his ass. Damn it, Reynolds, I've been waiting to get at that itch forever. Careful, dude, maybe you should grab the top of the table so you don't slide off. When he satisfied his itch, he firmly latched onto the top of the table. Cautiously always expecting a trick up the cloth's almighty sleeve. I inched toward the bars that separated us. Can you get up? He delicately rolled his torso from side to side. I could tell that his front hadn't been as viciously scaled by the lights and tortured as his back. I don't know. He tucked his legs up under his pelvis and then slipped back down. Legs work. He tried again, getting similar results. Because the middle of his monstrous body was so weak, he was as reluctant as I was after the acid incident to test his body's durability. He was either afraid he was going to break in half, or he was afraid his insides were going to spell out of the paper-thin remains of his back. The once vicious gang leader and most notorious killer in Los Angeles had been reduced to a defeated and crumbled shell of his former self, reluctant to rediscover mobility. Herman tugged his body up the span of the plexiglass table. As he wormed upward, lobs of skin broke off like tightly secured twine snapping a Christmas tree from the roof of a car. He wiped a week's worth of sneezes and teeth off his face. Presumably more annoying than the constant reminder that his ass itched, he seemed relieved to release that diamond-encrusted gold tooth off his cheek. While supporting most of his weight with one arm... He tucked the tooth into his pocket. Why are you keeping that? The tooth fairy isn't going to visit you here, I joked. Hilarious. He brought his hand back to the table and redistributed his weight as he pulled himself toward my cell. Careful, Herman, I advised as he began arching his back. I can't tell how solid that part of your body is. The last thing you want to do is have your guts drop out of you. He attempted to get a look at his back. Oh, what's this thing around my neck? I pointed to my collar. I'm guessing it's probably some kind of shock collar. I have one of those around my neck. I thought you were trying to be punk rock or something. I smirked. He thought I was a bigger poser than him. Unable to drag himself any further without causing possible permanent damage, he lost his balance yet again and slipped back to where he started. Shit! He looked at both his hands and reset the process a third time. Can you see my organs or anything, Reynolds? 
I stood on my tiptoes to look further down his body toward his back. Uh, it's mainly charred skin. I can't really tell if there's anything beneath it at all. Try and scrape some of it off so I can get a better idea of what's going on there. He rolled his eyes. Oh, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Meaning? You know what it means. I felt that we had made a lot of progress being locked up next to each other. I guess I was wrong. Actually, Herman, I don't know what it means. Do I have to spell it out for you? You want me to open it up further? From what I can feel... He pressed on the burn with the balls of his fingers. There isn't anything there now except for charred-ass Tommy Burger. I dropped down off my toes. That's what it looks like from here. He pulled himself up to the table's edge to create a little more support for the rest of his body. I could tell he was doing everything in his power to devise a scheme to somehow hopscotch onto the floor and then onto his bed without shaking up his innards and disturbing what little protective support his backside offered. I looked around his cell for an answer, wishing there was a gurney for him to transfer onto and then push himself to the bed. There was his IV machine and a small metal surgeon's table next to that. There was nothing that would support his weight. However, there was a roll of duct tape on the table. I turned away from being his lifeguard and headed back to my cot. Wait a second, Herman. In a rare showing of uncertainty, he blubbered. Where are you going? I nabbed my bargain pillow and rushed back to the bars. Here, I said, pushing the pillow toward him. Herman's head was nearly at the side of my cell. What do you want me to do with this, take a nap? No, jackass, wrap it up as best you can around your lower back with your free arm. I pointed to the small side table. Push that over to me first. Herman unenthusiastically followed my instructions. As he struggled to hold himself up on the table... He flicked the card up to the bars between us. Now what? I grabbed the tape and opened it with my teeth as Herman tried to tuck the pillow around his stomach without gliding back down the table onto the floor into his death. Okay, he said. Pull yourself up a little farther. Seemingly defeated, he whined. I can't. Shit, I said, reaching both of my hands into his cell extending my body as far over him as I could. I stuck the open end of the tape on one of his shoulder blades and then ran it across his back. Inch up a little. Herman pressed himself up slightly so I could run the tape roll under his chest. As I spun it back around for a second pass across his back, I felt how mushy his protection actually was. I didn't say anything. There wasn't any reason to alarm him before I gave my plan a try. Up again, I said. As carefully as if he was carrying a tray full of antique china, he arched himself up again. Quickly, I rolled the tape under him. His strength was fleeting. As soon as I signaled to him that the tape was clear, he thundered back onto his stomach. I stretched my arms further into his cell and threw the tape down to his side. I know this is going to be tricky, Herman, but you're going to have to try and secure the pillow onto your back. My arms won't reach it any further. Looking toward me like a helpless child, he continued to whimper. How? You've got to do it slowly by switching arms and maneuvering the tape roll under you across the table. I can't, Reynolds. Just as unsure as he was, I still tried to comfort him. Yeah, you can do it. Trembling and agitated, he sucked in the front of his body as he continued to grip onto the edge of the table. First using his ribcage, he pressed the roll under him by lightly rocking his body back and forth. As soon as he felt it pass through to the opposite side, he stuck its sticky side down so it wouldn't topple off the table. Then he brought his right arm around to the back, grabbed the tape and pulled it over to the right side of his body. Seeing that he was about to drift down the table again, I reached back into his cell and anchored both my arms around his wrist. I dug my combat boots into the crack cement to give him more support. With me lending my strength to the equation, Herman started winding the tape around the pillow and his body as quickly as possible. Point his carelessness caused the tape to twist so the gummy side wasn't sticking to the pillow. Tighter, I advised him. 
too busy to think about anything other than getting the chore done, he struggled furiously to get every inch of the sliver of tape around him until it ran out. His breath became heavy and sweat soaked his face. It's gone, Reynolds. The empty cardboard roll bounced off his floor into my cell. I don't think I got enough tape on the bottom to hold. Continuing to pull him up and myself backward on my heels, I tried to look over the hump on his back. I can't tell, I told him. How far down did you get? I don't know, he gasped. Maybe just past my kidneys. Reluctantly, I said. It'll have to do. Herman gripped his loose hand back to the top of the table. I eased off some of my pull and stepped sideways, trying to bridge the gap between his table and his bed. Hold on really tightly for a second, I directed, switching my support from his left wrist to his right, one hand at a time. Okay, I need you to do something now. His throat rasped as he tried to pace his breathing. I need to rest. Herman, if you rest, you're going to end up in a thousand pieces all over the floor. Listen to me. I let go of his wrist with my left hand and started dragging his other wrist off the table. I used all the strength I could muster as he let that arm off the table and into the security of my free hand. Once again rocking his torso, Herman shuffled across the table. Drop the leg now. I've got you. I squinted my eyes, preparing to have 300 pounds of pressure yank me into the metal bars. Be careful. As you hit the floor, continue arching your back. Keep your head upright, too. Without any comment, I steadied him as his first leg dropped toward the floor. Okay, now I'm going to pull you sideways so both of your legs can make contact with the ground. I pulled him around until I had turned his body about 45 degrees laterally. Then, I started to give him leeway as he wiggled his way down so that his bare toes touched the floor. He looked at me from under squinted eyelids. Are you sure? We have nothing to lose, I half assured him. He shuffled down until his bottom half stabilized his top half. I let the wrist go slowly until he was standing on his own. His back hunched over as his neck stretched out like a hungry giraffe. It was the only thing supporting the bowl of chili that used to be his cranium. You... you can let go now, he said, still unsure. I did. One carefully plodded foot at a time, he made his way to the cot in his cell. He placed his hands on the mattress and collapsed his knees underneath him. As soon as his sternum was safely on the bed, he let the rest of his limbs loosen with the exception of his neck which he propped up under his pillow to keep his head upright. I need this pillow, Reynolds, he said, letting out a convincing sigh of relief. Don't sweat it. I hated that pillow anyway. If you enjoyed tonight's story, Please be sure to join us again next week for the continuation of Drew Stepek's Knuckle Supper. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded non-profit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution and pornography. Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepik and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. For more than 20 years, Drew Stepek has written, produced, and directed for the publishing, online, and entertainment industries. Drew has worked for Film Threat, Sci-Fi Universe, Wild Cartoon Kingdom, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, 
Saturday Night Live, The Profiler, The Pretender, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and ESPN. In the past ten years, the author ventured into creative directing and ideation roles involving entertainment and technology marketing for Davy Brown Entertainment and Straight Up Technologies. In 2012, Stebek took a position as the head of branded entertainment for Machinima. He has also been a creative director at Awesomeness TV and is currently the head of integrated marketing at All Deaf Media. Born in Royal Oak, Michigan, Stepek moved around a bit as a young man and finally found his home in Hollywood, California in 1994. Stepek attended Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. His first novel, Godless, was released 666, June 6, 2006, and has since captured a strong underground following. Currently, Stepek is working on the sequels to Knuckle Supper and Knuckle Bald. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by, yours truly, Jason Hill. Additional performers have been featured when necessary to bring the tales to life. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respected authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Luke Hodgkinson under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's artwork and logo by Jason Hill. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure that you never miss an episode. And please, leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Thursday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button too to tell us how we're doing. Oh, and if you could, please leave a kind word or even a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for more than 500 free audio horror stories, including more performance from yours truly, and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Thursday with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, this is Jason Hill. Good evening.